BGMC. The biblical truth lives here. scriptures foretold of the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah Yeshua came to call the people back to the truth of His word and to follow that righteous path. Yeshua then called Jewish men to be His disciples, and after His death and resurrection, those Jewish men told the world about the Jewish Messiah. Now, after 2,000 years, Beth Goyim Messianic Congregation has that same calling of those Jewish men telling all people, both Jew and Gentile, about the proper ancient path, teaching the Route 66 King's Highway from Genesis through to Revelation, and how you need and can get back to the proper roots of the faith and a closer walk with God. Now, let's hear the message. Let's go get a blessing. What we're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be starting a new series over the next year or two. We're going to be going through the 613 mitzvot. We're going to experience of a lifetime, okay? The 613 commandments that were, are found in Torah are a way of life for those who really follow God. Yeshua spoke about them. He kept them. And it is our joy our job as people that are called by His name to follow in His commandments, to love His commandments. And we're going to learn about that today, going on to slide number two. Going on to slide number two. We're going to, that we're entitling this series, Absolute Truth. There is absolute truth, the 613 commandment. Uh, it's actually what our message from this past Shabbat was called, Absolute Truth. But the absolute truth is found right there in the words of the Lord. Going on to the next slide. There's an interesting uh, uh, little uh, verbiage from George Orwell, the man who wrote the, 19, bo the book 1984. Truth, it's the new hate speech. During times of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. And that is so, I mean, it's amazing. You know, when, back in way before 1984 when I was uh, commanded by my school to read this book, I didn't really read it, but there is so many prevalent things that he was able to see. And although this is not scriptural what he's saying, it is scriptural what he's saying. Because truth becomes incredibly um, scarce. Truth becomes um, what people don't know in times of universal deceit. When we raise up men and women, specifically men, really, who take over as leaders, and if they don't have the fear of God like most leaders around the globe today, then when we speak the truth that is found in Torah, that is found in the, the, the Bible, that is found in the Brit Hadashah, then there is, it becomes hate speech. It becomes hate speech. So truth, it's the new hate speech. You know, way back when, when you know, somebody called you a baloney nose or somebody called you, know, you a stupid so-and-so, that was hate speech. But now, speaking the truth from God's word, this is hate speech. So we're going to be going over the commandments of God. Going on to the next slide. But we're going to start first, because this is, a prefer this is the, the, everything to, to us who are believers in Messiah. Turn to Matthew 5. Verse 17 and 18. We're going to start there. Matthew, Matthew, Yahoo 5. Verse 17 and 18. I still don't have a picture from our camera. Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18. Don't think that I have come to abolish the Torah of the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to complete. Yes, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yod or a stroke will pass from the Torah, not until everything 
that must happen. Okay, we're going to start studying the Torah, the 613 commandments, but we have to start with some other basic understandings. The first understanding is that I'm a messianic believer. And what is a messianic believer? A messianic, a true messianic believer, because there's a lot of people that call themselves messianic believers, and it's it's become, unfortunately, a very watered down understanding. Okay, a lot of garbage out there, and I'm, it's sad to say. When I first became a believer, there was not this much garbage out there, but now there truly is. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and what I believe and what you know the role of Beth Goyim is in God's end time prophetic understandings. One. I'm a Jew, I'm a completed Jew. That means I'm a Jew through and through. I am from the seed of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Okay, we've always been Jews in my family, even through persecution, and a, a large part of the family died in the, in the Holocaust. Okay, I am a completed Jew. That means what? I believe in Messiah. That is Yeshua HaMashiach, the one who is foretold in over 400 places in the Old Testament. I believe in him as the Son of God. I believe in him as the author and the finisher of my life. He introduced himself personally to me. I met him face to face on a number of occasions. Okay, There is not one Christian ever that witnessed to me. He came and personally found me. And In the beginning of my walk, I was not as stringent on the Torah. But as I grew in understanding from a baby believer into a full adult believer, I came to understand that it is vitally important to understand verse 18. I'll read it again because it's so vitally important. There's so many people that supersede this with, with their misunderstandings of what the Rabbi Shaul said, Paul of Tarsus. And he didn't, Paul never contradicted this, so please understand that. Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yod or a stroke will pass from the Torah, not until everything that must happen has happened. So we are not in heaven, everybody. You might think where you're living is pretty nice. You know, if you're on the island in Hawaii, you know, it really is quite gorgeous. But it is not heaven. You might believe that you're in Jerusalem, and that is something that is good, but that is not heaven just yet. There, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, okay? There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And Yeshua the Messiah is saying that His laws, the laws of His Father, the laws that He agrees with in 100% are still in effect to this day. And we are going to be going through the categories of the law, one, one, one uh, mitzvot or commandment per category until we go through all 613, which is going to take a number of possibly a year or two. So it's a big study that we're doing, and it's, and it's a wonderful opportunity to share this because they are still in effect. There are temple laws, there are man laws, there are women laws, there are children laws, there are girl laws, boy laws. There are community laws, there are temple laws. And you have to find out what is laws for you. Because Yeshua said, until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a little pen stroke or a little dot of an I or cross of a T is going to be missing until heaven and earth pass away. Once heaven and earth pass away, there's only going to be a few things, and you'll find out what that is and if you read the book of Isaiah chapter 66. It tells you what, what's going to happen in the new heaven and a new earth, okay? But here, for us that are living here today on the old earth, okay, the first one that's made, if you believe in Messiah, it is vitally important to understand what he says, that until heaven and earth, okay, pass away, we must do whatever we can to complete these laws, whatever is applicable to our lives, okay? Now, we're going to go through a bunch of different laws throughout this whole teaching. Like, I'm a man. I don't have a menstrual cycle. Okay? Let's say I wasn't married. Then I don't have to deal with those, those, those situations of having a menstrual cycle. Okay? You're going to see what is for each person. And what, what I hope this teaching does is it puts a burden in your soul to desire to please the Lord. Because Yeshua said, who are my mother... Who are my brothers and sisters? Okay, those who do what my father wants. And Yeshua is saying, not until heaven and earth pass away. So you must do what is vitally important to you. If you want to get into heaven and have a favorable judgment, then you should do what it says here. Going on to the next slide. We're going on to Exodus 
20, Shemot 20. We're going to build this first. Before we get into the categories, we have to do some uh, house cleaning first. Exodus 20, verse 3 through 6, the second commandment, okay? The re now, is this something that's permanent, okay? This is a, a category that is outside of it, but it, it is part of the Torah. It's something that's permanent. Exodus, Shemot 20, verse 3 through 6, 3 through 6. You are to have no other gods before me. You are not to make for yourselves carved image or any kind of representation of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water below the shoreline. You're not to bow down to serve them, for I, Yehovah, your Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but displaying grace to the thousandth generation of those who love me and obey my mitzvot. Amen? So here, in verse 5, Yehovah says about himself, that is the Father, or Yehovah your Elohim, says, he says the Father, I am jealous. So when you bow down to others, when you bow down to serve any other gods that do not serve these commandments, he's very jealous, and he, he says, I'm going to punish you, okay, to the third and fourth generation. So what we're doing here with this teaching and preaching the laws of God and saying that, yes, both Jew and Gentile, and I will prove that through a bunch of scriptures in a minute, that Jew and Gentile must keep the commandments that are applicable to you because to the fourth generation, so that would be my son, his son, his son, his son. So my son, my grandson, my great-grandson, my great-great-grandson. If I do not follow the commandments, I am putting them up to my great-great-grandson in jeopardy if you believe that these are the words of God. And I know there, there, there was a Pew report that said that mo, the, uh, 50, over 55% of Jews do not believe the Torah is the word that was given by God. It's astounding. I do. I believe the Torah was given to us by God. I believe he told it to Moshe. I believe Moshe wrote it down verbatim as to what Elohim told him to say or Jehovah. Okay? Told him to say. But in verse 6, it is very important in verse 6. But displaying grace to the thousand generation of those who love me and obey my mitzvot. You see something very important as we go through this Torah teaching. Love has a condition. Okay? Love has a condition. To love God, as Yeshua said in John 14, verse 15, says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Well, what he's quoting is Exodus 20, Shemot 20, verse 6. Yeshua the Messiah is quoting Exodus 20, verse 6, when he says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Because love means obedience, okay? If you don't love, you are not obedient, okay? Same goes for marriage, okay? A husband says he loves his wife, but he goes to a prostitute, then he really doesn't love his wife because he's broken his marriage commitment of the marriage bed. He steps out of that marriage bed to sleep with another woman who is not his wife. He is a fornicator. He is an adulterer if she is married. Okay, But what is great about verse 6 is that this commandment has a promise. If you love and obey the mitzvot, he'll display grace to you that when you stumble and you don't do it completely right he says you know what that's my kid he's trying and I will display grace to my child because why I love him but love shows obedience to a commitment to a vow to a covenant okay a covenant between God and his people means obedience to his commandment and this is for Jew and Gentile. Going on to the next slide, it is a permanent regulation. This is a, what we're going to be looking at. Permanent regulation is the word, Hebrew word oyam. Okay? The Hebrew word oyam is permanent regulation. Okay? The definition for this, is, oyam means a long duration or antiquity. That means from ever or from forever. Oyam means everlasting. 
okay? It means eternity, okay? So here, when, when the Lord says these are forever or a permanent regulation, the Hebrew word olam or oyam all depends if you're Ashkenazi or Sephardic, okay? Olam, leolam ba'ed, how we say that, leolam ba'ed, okay? You're saying the word forever and ever, everlasting. That means it doesn't get stopped at the cross, okay? If, if Yeshua is the son of the Father, he would never break it. The Father would never break his commandment. Then he would be a liar, and the Father in heaven is not a liar, okay? And he doesn't break his commandments for anybody, okay? He doesn't break his word for anybody. It is our, our desire, our love, our commitment, our Brit, our Brit, our covenant, to keep His commandment forever. So these commandments that we're going to be going over in this teaching that's going to take a long time to do, which is okay, because it's what I want to do is take our time and go through these things, not to rush. We've done a Parash series for the last couple of years, going through each chapter that's on our website. You can go and see those. But now we're going to take it apart to each line because we've looked at the big picture now we're going to look at the parts of the puzzle. We've seen the journey from birth of the earth to Eretz Yisrael. Now we're going to say, now I'm a little bit older in the Lord. I need to understand what the forever means. What does everlasting mean? Because one of the things that's vitally important in the study of God's word is this. It never changes. And what is in, involved with me, okay? Well, the study of God's Word is that getting your Hebrew word, roots, finding out what words mean. Because words change, but God's Word doesn't. It's a very simple example. We have this problem of homosexuality today. In the 1800s, if I said, Oh, Brittany, you're so gay today. That meant... In the 1800s, that what meant she was happy, giddy, really joyful. Oh, that person was so gay. We were at a meeting, and he was so gay. I mean, he was so happy, so joyful, so happy. Now it means somebody who's going to Sheol, going to hell. It, oh, stop. Oh, stop, you big musky boy. It means Bruce Jenner, okay, you know, who's the woman of the year, okay? That's what it's changed into. But God's Word, this is why I will bring up definitions during this study that are vitally important to understand because God's word doesn't change, okay? And we know that it's true because the Hebrew scrolls have been around for a long, 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 long time, especially in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The mat what we have in the book of Isaiah today is a, a, an exact match of the Dead Sea Scroll of the book of Isaiah. I saw it for my own eyes, okay? So, olam or oyam, depending on how you say it, means forever, everlasting, Eternity. So when you see a permanent regulation in the scripture, it is this word. So understand its biblical definition for God doesn't change. Going on to the next slide, we're once again looking at permanent regulation. We're lo now looking at the Hebrew word hucha. 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 Okay. We're going to be looking at an ordinance, okay? A hucha, hucha, sorry, hucha is an ordinance or something prescribed, okay? A doctor gives you a, a prescription. He says, take it three times a day for seven days, okay? That's what you, if you're sick, this is what you're to do, okay? This is, there's the mitzvah, the commandment, and then there's going to be a way, how do we do the commandment? Like here, let's simply put, P Pesach, okay, you're to celebrate Pesach, okay, okay, well, what does that mean? The, then you have the hucha, that means the ordinance, something prescribed, how do I do it, okay? You have the mitzvot, that means this is what you have to do, and then you have the hucha, which means how to get it accomplished, you know, from sundown on the 14th day of the first month to complete darkness, you are to celebrate the Pesach. How, okay, what does that entail? Well, I need the lamb, I need the maror, I need the matzah, you know, the things that you need, okay? This is something prescribed. And it's vitally important to understand if you're going to have a, a, 
a winning walk with the Lord. What do I mean with a winning walk with the Lord? How Rav Shaul says, I run the race. And Yeshua says, till the end. That's when you win. Okay, when you get up there and the Lord says, well done, my good and faithful servant, or he, or he says to you, who are you? Okay, I don't know you. Get away from me, you worker of lawlessness. Okay, Matthew 7. Okay, so here it's not enough just to know the commandment. It's you have to do the kuka, which is the prescription. How do I achieve the commandment in the way that the Lord, Jehovah, wants? Going on to the next slide. Now, we always get, um, and there's been, a, and there was a newsletter I got today that, you know, one of the, uh, a teacher, a Gentile teacher of the law was talking about, which I've run into a lot, where um, people say, well, these laws are only for when you live in Israel. So this next section that we're going to go through over for the next bit of time is no matter where you live. The Lord, you know, is the Lord not the Lord of all the earth? Does the Lord, you know, think the, the Filipinos are too stupid to follow his commandments? No. Does he think the Chinese are too stupid? No. Does he think the Americans are too stupid? Probably. Um, does he think the Puerto Ricans are too stupid? Probably. I mean, the, the Mexican? No. no. There's smart people in every culture, in every creed on the earth, every, every boundary of the earth, because, listen, there's no races. If you look, you know, we all come from Adam and Chava. Okay, there are no races, just different shades of a skin color. Okay, don't let anybody fool you into saying, well, there are races. No, there are not. When I put you under a microscope, you know what? Uh, your blood is the same as another person's blood on the planet. Slight variations, but that's it. Okay, so here, no matter where you live, these commandments deal with the fact that Jehovah knew that we would not live in Israel always. Okay, we're going to go through a, a bunch of different commandments because we're setting this whole study up. There has to be some, some preface before we get into each and every commandment because if you don't believe that Yeshua, what Yeshua said in Matthew 5, verse 18, if you don't believe that, well, then the rest of it really does not matter much at all. If you don't believe that, that you have to do this living wherever you're living outside the land of Israel, one, you're a donkey, but two, it's not what God said. Okay, you know, we, I'm going to prove it through the Word of God. I'm not going to pro prove it through Talmud. I'm not going to prove it through the Zohar or the, the Kabbalah or the writings around. I'm going to prove it with His Word and what He says. And if we need to go to a dictionary to find out what that word really means, because also my methodology is this. I generally read the CJB, which is the Complete Jewish Bible. And sometimes I want to go a little deeper, so I'll go to the NASB, which is a, a very, uh, one of the best translations I find because it went from the original Hebrew to English. And in the Greek, uh, in the New Testament, it went from the original Greek to English. Okay? Then, if that, that's not good enough, then I go to original, uh, a Hebrew scroll to make sure the words that I'm reading in the CJB, the NASB, match up with what I see in a Torah scroll. Okay? That's my methodology. I think it's pretty solid. Okay? So here, in this next part of what we're talking about, the commandments deal with the fact that God knew. God knew everything. You know, when he created the world and it broke up into sin getting in, he knew everything that would happen. Not that he didn't know that sin was going to happen. He knew that was going to happen too because he's Jehovah and he's the existing one. Okay? He knew that we would not live in Israel, so why would he give us these rules? And he knew that most of us would not be living there for 2,000 years, right? Wouldn't that, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't that be stupid? Well, you know, up until you, know, you get kicked out of Israel in 70, well, you know, once you're out of there, psh, do whatever you want because you're in the diaspora. No. He knew that we would spend time away from Eretz Israel. He knew that many Jews would be living in the four corners of the earth. That's why he told the prophets, I, in the end of days, will call back my people from the four winds. He already knew before Israel came into in existence, Back after, you know, the Maccabees, okay, got back the, the, the temple, and then, you know, that whole thing with Antiochus Epiphanes, okay, he knew that we would be scattered throughout the globe, so he wrote things, and we're going to prove it, that we should be following the Word of God no matter where we live. Going on to the next slide. Going on to the next slide as my computer is slow here. Hello? Hello? 
Hold on one second. My computer's uh, doing something real slow. Oh, dee 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 dee. Do 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 do. All right, all right. No matter where you live, let's start with that. Let's start with Leviticus 23, verse 9 through 14. Fiacre 23, verse 9 through 14. Leviticus 23. Verse 9 through 14, we're, gonna, we're prefacing this whole study. We'll try to get through 10 of the, uh, the categories tonight, but like I said, this is the beginning part. It's going to be a long study, but we must lay a foundation first, okay? Because if you don't have the foundation, then nothing else is going to matter. Leviticus 23, verse 9 through 14 states, You always said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, after you enter the land I'm giving you and harvest its ripe crops, you're to bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest to the Kohen. He is to wave the sheaf before Jehovah so that you would be accepted. The Kohen is to wave it on the day after Shabbat. On the day you wave the sheep, you're to offer a male lamb without defect in its first year as a burnt offering. Its grain offering is to be one gallon of fine flour mixed with olive oil, an offering made by fire to Jehovah as a fragrant aroma. It's a drink offering. It is to be wine of one quart. You are not to eat bread, dried grain, fresh grain, until the day you bring the offering for your Elohim. This is a permanent regulation through all your generations, no matter where you live. No matter where you live. Verse 14 is that no matter where you live. So Jehovah knew that we would be living in America, the Philippines, England, all over the globe, all those countries, he knew that Jews would be living everywhere except for the land of Israel for almost 2,000 years. And he said, you are to do the Bikarim offering, okay? No matter where you live. This is what Bikarim, first fruits, okay? You're to wave before the Lord, the sheaf, okay? Or, as you know, we're doing in our study, what it is you're as a farmer doing, okay? We're not going to get deep into the other stuff at the moment if you want that Whole study, go to our website and do the 10 Kadosh Mikra study. It's a 13-part study at the moment, okay? But I wanted to show you that we, the Lord is talking about doing His Moed, His first fruit, His Bikarim, no matter where you live, okay? So this is a permanent regulation because no matter where you live, you're to do this because God never changes. Okay, so one because a lot of people, there are teachers out there, unfortunately, even messianic teachers that say, well, you only have to do this in the land of Israel. Okay, well, you have to do the wave offering. You you can't if you don't have an altar. You can't do your wine that your wine offering for this, and you can't do the male lamb without defect if you don't have an altar. Okay, then now we will get into how to build an altar during this study. Okay, so if you can't build an altar like I live in an apartment, okay? I have no means to be able to build an altar in my apartment. It would look kind of funny in the middle of my living room and then one offering and then the apartment goes up in flames, okay? So if you don't have the, the, the wherewithal or the abilities, if you don't live on a farm, okay, where you can build it in accordance with Scripture, then that part you can't do because God knows you live in an apartment, okay? Then... You know, some places, a male lamb without defect. Okay, well, I don't have an altar, so I can't go get a, male, a lamb without defect, okay, unless you're going to cook it, okay? So if I don't have an altar, okay, so what do I do? But the, the part of bringing the wave offering on the proper day is the, the, what you want to be doing, and we'll get into the classifications in a minute. But what I'm showing you is the beginning layer is Bikarim, or first fruits, primera fruta in Spanish, okay? You do this waving on its proper day, the day after Shabbat of Pesach, okay? So it's not Shabbat. Pesach is not Shabbat. It is like a Shabbat, but you have to wait until after the Shabbat and do the waving on the proper day, no matter where you live, okay? So that's why we can all look at the moon. And then you do your 
14th day, see the moon, Rosh Kodesh, da -da 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 -da, 14 days, then follow the Sabbath, then boom. Okay, it's very simple. Not very hard, but no matter where you live. Going on to the next part, verse 15 through 21. 15 through 21. From the day after the day of rest, that is, from the day you bring the sheaf for waving, you are to count seven full weeks. Until the day after the seventh week, you are to count 50 days. And in order to present a new grain offering to Jehovah, you must bring bread from your homes for waving. Two loaves made with one gallon of fine flour baked with leaven, the first fruits of, for Jehovah. Along with, the bread of the present, uh, along with the bread, present seven lambs without defect, one year old. One young bull, two rams, these will be a burnt offering for Jehovah, with their grain and drink offerings, an offering made by fire as fragrant aroma for Jehovah. One male goat as a sin offering, and two male lambs, one year old, as a sacrifice of peace offering. The cone will wave them with the bread of the first fruits and the wave and the offering before Jehovah. With the two lambs, these will be holy for your Jehovah, uh, for Jehovah, for the Kohen. On the same day, you're to call a holy convocation. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. This is a permanent regulation, O Yom, through all your generations, no matter where you live. Okay, amen? So this is Shavuot. Some people know it as Pentecost, which just means 50 in Greek. Okay? So here, there's a bunch of different things that are going on. Some are the temple offerings, because to bring seven uh, male lambs um, with, is kind of expensive. Okay? And where do you get the seven male lambs without defect unless you're a shepherd or you live in a farming community where you can go get seven male lambs? Then you need an altar. But what you can do that you are required to do for this one, no matter where you live, is verse 17. Bring bread from, from your homes for waving. Okay, everybody can make two loaves with one gallon of fine flour. So half a gallon of, of fine flour for each loaf of bread. It's one, one of my favorite holy days because I love bread, as you can see from my belly. Okay. Okay, it is a permanent regulation. This is the second time we're seeing no matter where you live. Okay, so we had a spring, no matter where you live. Now we have a summer, no matter where you live. Did God not know that we would not be living in the land of Israel? So here in this uh, Shavuot understanding, you count the, the, the weeks from the day after the Shabbat to the day after the Shabbat, the 50. Okay, very simple, but... You can't say it's only for Israel because why? Verse 21 is very specific. It has, let's read it again. On the same day, you're to call a holy convocation. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. This is a permanent regulation through all your generations, no matter where you live. So here, once again, that's why we went over the Oyam or Olam, whichever way you want to say it, okay? Permanent regulation. That means it never stops. It's everlasting. It's forever. Until heaven and earth disappear, Yeshua said in Matthew 5, 18, you're to do these things. Okay? So some Christian says, we don't got to do the law anymore. Well, you're calling God a liar. And I don't suggest that since uh, you got your great-grandchildren on the line of having problems. Okay? So, but if you want to be blessed lo and you love God, then you will do His commandments. Very simple but very hard to understand. Well, Paul says, Paul says, Paul says, you know what? Paul's not God. Yeshua is the Son of God, therefore He is God. This is what I believe, and this is what Beth Goyim teaches. If you don't like that, check out our website, This Statement of Faith. You know, it's very long, as I've been told, it's the longest statement of faith uh, on the planet from the Messianic perspective. Okay? But I don't want people wasting my time, and I don't want you wasting your time. You don't th think this is cool? Well, that's all right. I'm not the one that's going to get mad at you, but my Father in Heaven is. Okay? So here we see the second time, permanent regulation, no matter where you live. Okay? Going on to the next slide, let's now look at verse 26 through 32. Jehovah said to Moshe, The tenth day of the seventh month is Yom Kippur. You would have a holy convocation. You are to deny yourselves, <coughs> excuse me, and you are to bring an offering made by fire to Jehovah. You are not to do any kind of work on a day in this Yom Kippur to make atonement before you, you before Jehovah your Elohim. Anyone who does not deny himself on that day is to be cut off from his people. And anyone who does any kind of work on that day, I will destroy 
from among his people. You are not to do any kind of work. It is a permanent regulation through all your generations, no matter where you live. It will be a Shabbat of complete rest, and you are to deny yourselves. You are to rest on the Shab your Shabbat from evening of the ninth day until the, the following evening. Okay? So here, in verse 23, it is very important to understand, I mean, not 23, verse 31, chapter 23, verse 31. Let's look at it again while eating our nails. You are not to do any kind of work. It is a permanent regulation through all your generations, no matter where you live. Okay, once again, in verse 31, we see the word permanent regulation. Okay, that's the English of the Hebrew, which is oyam, forever, everlasting. Okay, are you getting the, the pattern of which we're showing here? That the rules are to be kept. Okay, if you're to keep the holy days as we're going through in the, the Viacra 23 scripture here, then you have to then do offerings. Okay, well, how do I do an offering? Well, then you have to understand what is a unblemished animal, okay? No matter where you live. It's so this is on all of, if, if, if you go off God's earth, if you're living on the moon, uh, you still have to do it because it says no matter where you live. Since God created the heavens and earth, so if you're living on Mars, you know, a thousand years from now, you know, if the Lord allows us to live and we're living on Mars or Jupiter or whatever planet you want to call it, those are pagan names, but whatever, no matter where you live, okay? See, the Lord thinks of everything because he's amazing. Going on to the next slide. Now, what we're going to be looking at here is the same teaching is to apply equally to the citizen and the foreigner. Now, you know, many people have said, well, those laws are for the Jews. Those laws are for the Jews, okay? Um, well, let's see what the Word of God says, okay? We're going to go through a bunch of different scriptures because, like I said, this is foundational for the rest of the study, okay? So here, if you're a follower of Jehovah, if you're a believer in His Son, if you, you ha have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost or the Ruach HaKodesh, then no matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, because we're supposed to be one family of God, as in Romans 11, where you're part, you're grafted in Gentiles. So let's see, do you got to follow the laws? Do the Jew have to follow the law? Well, the Jew, okay, we already know it's a permanent regulation no matter where you live. But now we always have that argument about, well, the Gentiles don't have to follow that. Well, let's see what God's Word says. Okay, if some, and, and if the New Testament, if anything in the New Testament is contradicting this, then you must be reading it wrong because God's Word would never contradict itself. So let's start in Shemot 12, Exodus 12, verse 19. Exodus 12, verse 19. Shemot 12, verse 19. This is the same teaching is to apply equally to the citizen and to the foreigner. During those seven days, we're talking about Hagmatzah, no leaven is to be found in your houses. Whoever eats food with chametz, leavening in it, is to be cut off from the community of Israel. It doesn't matter whether he is a foreigner or a citizen of the land. Amen? All right, so here, what do you mean? I'm a Gentile. I'm, I'm not under those laws anymore. Uh, let's read that again. During those seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. Whoever eats food with hamets in it is to be cut off from the community of Israel. It doesn't matter whether he is a foreigner or a citizen of the land. Amen? Okay, now remember, no matter where you live, remember Yeshua is the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. He's the owner of heaven and earth. So here, you're living amongst the Jews, the community of Israel, because why? He's the king of the Jews, and he rose from the grave, and you know, he's the first son. He's the Bikarim. He's the Bikor. He's the first one. He rose from the grave. He gets a double portion, so we got heaven and earth. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether he's a foreigner. What's a foreigner? It's a band. Yes, it's a band. Okay, but what's a foreigner? What's a foreigner? An Ecuadorian? Okay, yes, there are foreigners to America. But then if I went to Ecuador, I guess I would be the foreigner. No, okay. A foreigner in the biblical understanding is what? 
somebody who is not of the bloodline of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Okay? Somebody who's a foreigner is not from the bloodline of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. This is the covenant. This is the Brit, the covenant. Okay? The covenant line. Others can be part of it because why? It's God's earth and He wants you to be part of it because He wants to bless. God wants to bless, but He wants to see us to shuva, repent and return to His ways. So here the same teaching is going to apply equally, equal blessings and equal curses. So in Deuteronomy 28, the blessings will also be all the Gentiles because why? If you're a believer in Messiah, then you are engrafted in, i.e. Romans 11. You're part of the house of Israel. So the same blessing of God passing you over, the same blessing of you being let into heaven, Hashemayim, the same blessing of God financially blessing you and everything else, the blessings of the womb, the blessings of the home, the blessings of Shalom, my Shalom I give to you, the 23 meanings of that, what Yeshua said, is also for the foreigner, those who are not from the seed of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, who are engrafted in. Okay? But if the foreigner eats chametz during Hag Matzah, the week of Hag Matzah, the seven days of Hag Matzah, from the 15th of the first month, then the, the post, uh, those seven days thereafter, then you're going to be cut off from the community of Israel. And if you're cut off from God's community of Israel, then you're cut off from the blessings. Because why? The same teaching will apply equally to the citizen and the foreigner. Okay? Let's now go to verse 49. Exodus 12, verse 49. See, when you see something more than once, you better take notice of it. Exodus 12, verse 49. So we're still in the same chapter. So just slide your finger down to find verse 49 and underline that one also. You should be underlining all these. You should color code them. Like all the, the, the ones where it says the same teachings as applying to a foreigner. I don't know. Make those purple. Okay? Uh, okay. There you go. And then, you know, for the other ones, you know, permanent regulation. Make those blue because that's like heaven. I don't know. Make your own color code. And then put it in the front of your Bible and write it in pen next to each color so you know what you did because people will forget. It's like passwords. Okay? Verse 49, the same teaching is to apply equally to the citizen and the foreigner living among you. So, okay, now, now I'm not going deep into which it is, but once again, we're seeing the same teaching, the Torah, is to apply equally to the citizen and the foreigner. Who's a foreigner? Those who are not of the blood of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Okay? Uh, and living among, living among you. Well, what does it mean to live among you? What does it mean to live among you? Well, that might be the earth. Since Yeshua is the Aleph and the Tav, the, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, He owns Hashemayim and Ha'aretz, the heaven and earth. Okay? He owns everything because Daddy gave it to Him. He gave, he gave Him this world. And so here, you were living amongst the Jew. Who is the Jew? The King of the Jews, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord HaOlam, Yeshua the Messiah, the light of the world. Okay? The same teaching. Why? Because it's a permanent regulation, Oyam, and no matter where you live. Okay? Because why? Because God loves everybody. He wants to bless everybody. Now, let's go over to Viacra 24. Okay? Viacra 24, Leviticus 24, verse 16. Leviticus 24, verse 16. Verse 24, verse, chapter 24, verse 16. And whoever blasphemes the name must be put to death. The entire community must stone him. The foreigner, as well as the citizen, is put to death if he blasphemes the name. Okay, now here's a real checkmate for anybody. How is the foreigner going to know the rule unless it was told to him? Okay, so the same teaching is to apply equally to the citizen and the foreigner. Who's the citizen? Okay? The citizen is those of the seed of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Okay? And the foreigner, the ger, or the goyim, 
living among you. So whoever blasphemes the name of Jehovah must be put to death, must be put to death. So God is going to put you to death, okay? W once we're living in community, anybody who blasphemes the name, you're going to get stoned in the community. If I'm running in the community, better believe it. We're going to live by these rules because I know that these rules are good. I know that these rules are great. I know that these rules were given from God. God. I know that God wrote them. He gave them to Moses, and Moses wrote them down verbatim from the, word of, from the mouth of the Lord. And if you don't believe that, well, that's cool. When you die, you'll find out because you have a soul that returns back to God. And for judgment, and that judgment won't be good. You want the judgment to be good in your favor, then you must do these rules equally to the citizen and the foreigner, no matter where you live. The holy days, and now for blaspheme the Lord's name. The Lord's taking this out on everybody, okay? Kill that person. Put them to death. Not murder. Kill, because we don't want people taking the Lord's name lightly. It should be reverenced with the highest order. And we don't do that, and we should. But we'll get into that later. But we're really focusing on the chastisement that the Lord says for both the Jew and the Gentile. Going on now to the beginning of the categories. There are 34 separate categories of the Torah. But, you know, to, most people think, well, Torah means a law. No. Torah means perfect instructions from Yehovah, perfect directions from a loving Father, perfect laws to live our life by. Okay? Instructions, directions, law. Torah is Perfect instructions from the Father in heaven. Yeshua and the Father are one, therefore Yeshua kept them. Yeshua said, Matthew 5, 18, what? Not one jot or tittle will be missing until heaven and earth pass away. Perfect directions from a loving Father. He wants us children to follow step one, step two, and step three. And since beginning our school, we have found out that most children don't know how to follow more than one step. This is an amazing Absolutely amazing you know, how bad the public school system is. Perfect laws to live your life by, okay? See, this is the other thing that God's laws teach you. When you follow God's ordinances, you get a much better mind. Because why? Because you're thinking in multiple steps, which most human beings in this world today don't know how to do that. We are so low level. Why? Because the body of Messiah... Well, Jew and Gentile say, well, we don't got to follow the law anymore. Well, you need to follow the law because it brings your mind to a higher level because you're following the king. Okay? Torah was kept by Messiah, and we are supposed to be like him. If you call yourself a Christian, that means Christ-like. Okay? If so, if you're, you're calling yourself a Christian, but you're not following the commandments, you're not Christ-like. You're satanic-like. Okay? It's that simple. Going on to the next slide. We're going to begin category number one. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready, Eddie? Are you ready? For the great shofar sound. Category number one of 34. Category number one of 34. So get your notebooks ready. Maybe make a different page. I don't know. But what we are going to be doing with this study is not just going with the categories. What we are going to be doing is showing the category and then where it is found in the Brit Hadashah. But once you understand the understanding of the Torah and then you re read it in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, you'll go, well, I read that very differently. Yes, you will, because it's one book, one book. And if you don't understand the beginning, you certainly will not understand the Brit Hadashah. Going on, to category 1, verse 34. We're going to start with the name, the name of Jehovah, to know that he exists. That's the first category that is the top category, to know that he exists. And please turn, because we're going to be doing a lot of, over the next uh, 10 minutes or so, we'll see what categories we can get through. We want to just keep each teaching to one hour long. And don't worry, we're going to be doing this for a couple of years, probably two years. Okay, it's okay. Take your time, study because God loves you to study His Word. Deuteronomy 5, verse 6. Okay? Deuteronomy 5, verse 6. This is category 1, Jehovah, to know 
that he exists. The first part is to know that he exists. The Pew report, you know, that the, the, this came out for America was fascinating. You'll hear so much about it in tomorrow's message. Um, what believers believe today is just horrendous. This is why understanding that you need to follow the Torah is vitally important. Deuteronomy 5 or 6, Aleph. I am Jehovah your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Egypt where you lived as slaves. A amen? So the first part here, to know he's exists, because he says it in the first half of the sentence. I am Jehovah your Elohim. I am. Okay? Knowing that he exists, knowing that he was the one that brought us out, knowing that he is the one that, that created everything, knowing that he is the one who's in charge of everything, knowing that he is the one who made the birds in the air, knowing that he is the one that made the fish in the ocean, and knowing he's the one that created this ball that we're sitting on that has gravity, and it doesn't feel like you're, you're falling over. Isn't it weird? You know, we're on a ball, but we don't feel like we're tipping over. We're on a ball, but the water doesn't slip off. We're on a ball, but we don't need, you know, magnet shoes to keep us down. Isn't that amazing? And the first part of any of the law is to first get this concept this is the greatest concept to understand, but most people don't understand it. They'll go, well, there's a God, but I don't know what he does. No, you have to understand that he is the only one. There are no other gods. There is only one God to know that he exists. This is the foundation, the cornerstone of your scriptures. This is the cornerstone of those who truly believe in Messiah and truly believe in the Father. This is the cornerstone to know that he exists. But once you understand that he exists, then everything else in the 34 categories and every law that's there falls into a greater understanding because once you know that he's existed, well, where did he come from? I have no idea. He's been existing forever, and I don't need to know anything else. Well, that's not good enough for me. Well, good luck with that. Okay? The foundation of my life and what I believe and what drives me each and every day is this fact that I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Father in Heaven exists. I know that He's, he's the one who brought us by the hand out of the land of Egypt because He wanted to bring us to Himself. We were done with our time out. We were done with the prophecy. And He, he brought us by His hand. Now, with that understanding... With that understanding of that, that great concept that we just went through, let's now take it to the Brit Hadashah. Turn to John 8, John 8, verse 58. Category 1 of 34, Brit Hadashah. Yochanan, John chapter 8, verse 58. We're now looking in. To, he exists, he exists, that Jehovah exists, to know that he exists, okay? You know, to know that he exists, John 8, verse 58, John 8, verse 58, Yeshua said to them, yes, indeed, before Abraham came into being, I am. Oh, what did, what did we read in Devarim 5, verse 6? I am the one who brought you, I, I'm the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When the powerful am. So when Yeshua said, before Abraham came into existence, I am. He's the one that's part of that. But now you start to get a greater concept of why Yeshua said that he, why he said this line to the Pharisees. Why he said what he said. Why the words that he chose are very, very, very important. Okay? He chose his words very carefully. Okay? Before, let's read it again, verse 58, Yochanan 8, verse 58. Yeshua said to them, Yes, indeed, before Abraham came into being, I am. Abraham lived like way before you. How did you do that? Well, because he's the existing one, he's with the Father. It's one, they're of one mind, one spirit. They're two separate entities. I'm not going to get into the Godhead at a, a whole dissertation at this point in time. But what, it is, what he's saying is that I existed. Okay? I existed 
before the foundation of the world. Before the world was made, he danced in the heavens. He enjoyed his father as he made everything. He danced, he played, he enjoyed. Okay? So he is the existing one. Before any of us were made, where any of us were thought about from the Lord our God, our King, Yehovah, Yeshua is saying with John 8, verse 58, I am. Now, without studying the law, you really didn't understand what he was talking about. So once he says this, everything else of the 34 categories, the 613 laws, falls into place, and it gives him even more credibility and more understanding of why we have to follow the Torah. Because if Yeshua is saying, I am, to these people, he's still saying, I am to us, he is the existing one. Okay? Now, let's go to category two. Category two. Category two of 34, the Torah. The Torah. To learn Torah and to teach it. To learn Torah and to teach it. This is category number two. The Torah, to learn Torah and teach it. Devarim 6, verse 6 and 7. Devarim 6, verse 6 and 7. Give you a second to get there. If you're writing and you're finding it in your Bible. These words which I am ordering you today are to be upon your heart and you're to teach them carefully to your children. You're to talk about them when you sit at home when you're traveling on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Amen? Now, this is a powerful category. I'm going to spend some time on it, and we'll final it up uh, with this teaching after the Brit Hadashah part. Now, here in this category, it is to learn Torah and then to teach it. Now, verse 6 pre precedes verse 7. Okay, yeah, that's pretty simple. But what is vitally important here is, let's read it, these words which I am ordering you today are to be on your heart. Not in your heart with this part, but on your heart as a covering, as a protection of your heart. On your heart means upon you, something like a protection around something that is vital. So you, you can live without a lung, right? You can live without a lung. You can live without a kidney. You can live without a lot of different things. But what you can't live without is a heart. You only have one heart. Once something happens to that heart, then everything else falls apart. So here, before you can teach it to somebody, you must place them on your hearts so that it is encompassing of your life, okay? Then, in verse 7, who are you to teach them to? To the children. Why? So that you can have a community that knows God. This is category 2, but what was category 1? One that knows God, that fears God, to know He exists, to know they follow His rules. So from the time they are babies, from the youngest time, you're teaching them, they're hearing the Shema, every morning, every evening, okay? We didn't get to that part yet, but we, everybody knows that already, okay? So here, these words which, which who is ordering? Not Moshe, but Jehovah. He is ordering you today, not recommending, not saying, well, at the cross, we're going to stop doing this, okay? Here, I'm ordering you today that these commandments, these rules... These oyam, these things that are forever, these things that, that are, no matter where you live, are to be on your heart, because if they're on your heart guarding this vital organ, then everything else will fall into place. The blessings will fall into place. And it, you teach them carefully. You should teach 
the order. How does it get done? How do we do Passover? How do we do Hagmatzah? How do we do Shavuot? How do we count the days? How do we see Rosh Kodesh? How do we look for a, an animal that's unblemished? How do we wear the tzitzit? What does it mean to wear it? All these different things is in the Chucha, how the order gets done, the prescription. You're to talk at the, about them when you sit at home, okay? All your life, your life is supposed to be about all this. Well, isn't there some time for fun? Yes, the laws of God are fun. Okay? Well, I want to walk in. So many people forget the word of God. When you get all into the other stuff, then you don't follow God's rule. Okay? When you're traveling on the road, okay? This is an encompassing idea. It's the way our lives are supposed to be that God wants because once you get up to heaven, and that's your goal, is to get up to heaven, okay? When you lie down and when you get up, you to talk about and teach them so in the morning you get up with your children, you pray with your children. When you go to bed, what do you do? You, you, you put your children to bed, you pray to God, okay? Now with that understanding, let's go to our last part. Let's go to the Brit Hadashah. Let's go to the Brit Hadashah. Category 2 of 34, the Torah and the Brit Hadashah. To learn and teach it. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Let's start with Ephesians. Yes, my cousin Paulie. Now you're going to look at Ephesians in a whole nother light. Yes, sir. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, to learn and to teach it. This is great. This will be like, ah, too many Christians. Okay? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, you can probably see some hair falling out to some people. Ah. Fathers, don't irritate your children and make them resent resentful. Instead, raise them with the Lord's kind of discipline and guidance. What? Now you understand what he's talking about, because why? He's a rabbi taught by Gamaliel, who was a great rabbi that taught very much, very similar to Yeshua, okay? He's also quoted in the book of Acts, okay? That's how much the Lord thought of Gamaliel, that he's even in the book of Acts as a positive influence. Wait, what? that was so good in Ephesians 6, 4. Let's read it again. Fathers, don't irritate your children to make them resentful. Instead, raise them with the Lord's kind of discipline and guide. What kind of Lord's discipline would that be? Say suno tres. Say suno tres. Say suno tres. Okay? What kind of guidance are we talking about? Say suno tres. Say suno tres. Say suno tres. 613. I got to do it for English or just this only English crowd. 613. 613. 613 is in me. Okay. <laughs> okay. The discipline in God. This is what Rav Shaul was telling the baby Messianic congregation in Ephesus. These were Gentiles that were coming over to be Messianic believers. Yes. Now you understand what he's talking about because it's, it's tied together with category two. Now that was so hard. That was so good. Now one last part. Turn to Luke 8. Luke 8. Luke 8, verse 15. Luke 8, verse 15. Hi, my whole life just got crashed down. That's all right. You'll be built up in the way of the potter's image of what he wants. Luke 8, verse 15. Luke 8, verse 15. What fell on rich soil. These are the ones who, when they hear the message, Hold on to it with a good, receptive heart, and by persevering, they bring forth a harvest. Well, once you understand to learn Torah and to teach it, you understand the receptive heart part. Because why? These laws in Devarim 6, verse 7, uh, verse 6, verse 6, Devarim 6, 6, is to be on your heart. Oh, that's what Messiah is talking about. This is receptive heart is about desiring to bless the generation because of being obedience. What did we start out? Obedience. 
God wants you to be obedient. To know He exists. Know that He never changes. Know that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Discipline and guidance. The Lord's discipline and guidance with a receptive heart. That God's Word is good. The Father would never give us something bad. And that's what we're going to end on for this first part of the 613. It has been a wonderful time to bring forth this beginning section of this message. I bid you an amen and an amen. Shalom. This is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to The Remnant's Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, bethgoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about Him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. And click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnants Call. If you have not taken your first steps to be born again, just ask God's help. Remember, it's His loving grace that has come to find you. No one is worthy or able to reach God, but God can reach us, and He's reaching out to you now. Just open your heart and let Him in. His arms are open, and the blessing of salvation and eternal life are waiting for you. Don't let it wait any longer. Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his shalom. Shalom. My name is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman, and I invite you to come to visit our congregation. If you are in the tri-state area, come out and visit with us on Shabbat. We are a congregation of Jews and Gentiles, living as one in the Messiah Yeshua. BGMC is a place of true worship. The focus never wanders from the Hebraic roots of our faith. Beth Goyim is rooted in the Word of God from Bereshit through to the book of Revelation. Messiah's strong words against man-made tradition are carefully recorded in Matthew 7. That is the reason we only follow the straight-up instructions found in Scripture, truly the way, the truth, and the life. If you're looking for a deeper walk with Adonai, come out for our Tuesday evening Bible study called Messianic Torah Time. Come, spend a day with us on any Shabbat. We start at 11 a.m. with the sound of the ancient Hebrew shofar. Next, we offer our King praise and worship in English, Hebrew, and Spanish. After worship, we review the headlines in the previous week's news from around the globe, especially news from the Holy Land, Israel. We don't just list the news headlines as current events, but we comb through the scriptures, searching for clues to understand what they mean and then to help pinpoint prophetically our current position on Adonai's clock. After digesting all that modern information, we leave the world behind as we journey with our Adonai deep into his eternal word not with just one or two scriptures, but usually seven or more scriptures. The spiritual nourishment and the richness of his kingdom become accessible to the ones who share this special time and seek them out. The day does not end there. Because Shabbat is so special to him, there is always so much more that our king desires to share. So instead of separating and leaving, we stay together as a family 
for potluck lunch and an afternoon study of our King's Word. We close this Shabbat together with a reading of the new week's parasha. That's the Torah portion. Even after those blessings, many of us just can't get enough. So the members bring prepared homemade foods to share while we all enjoy an uplifting movie together. If all that information is not quite enough, you can check out our website where you will find over 200 video teachings and biblical holy day studies. Under Messianic Torah Time, the Hebrew Roots button, you'll discover free studies on many, many different topics, including PowerPoint slide presentations. If Beth Goyim sounds like a place you'd love to visit, but you live outside the tri-state area, there is still a way to connect with us. We stream live on the internet on Tuesday, Thursday, and Shabbat. The website is www.bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. Our phone number is 973-338-7800 or 978-2-YESHUA. That's 978, the number 2, YESHUA. Shalom.